Uh, so my name is Chris Bourne. I'm from Healthcare UK, which is part of the International Trade Department of the UK based in London, working closely with our trade advisors here in Delhi and other cities in uh, India. So we are uh, um, uh, bringing, uh, on this occasion, 11 uh, companies from the UK uh, with uh, a lot of different technologies to support uh, healthcare in India and to work with Indian companies on a commercial basis as partners. Um, today we have uh, very exciting uh, int uh, announcements, uh, including our a collaboration with Niti Aayog and the Indian government to develop, uh, to make the use of artificial intelligence help us uh, reach remote communities, remote patients, and to be able to diagnose them more easily. So in another room there's an announcement today about five shortlisted British companies uh, who are going to be working, some of whom will be working with Niti Aayog to develop this technology in, uh, in remote parts of India. Um, alongside that we have uh, uh, collaborations between companies. So there's a company called Quantum DX, uh, which is collaborating with an com Indian company called Molbio. And what they provide is molecular diagnostics uh, in the field, in remote areas, in rural areas. Uh, for example, at the moment they are able to test for tuberculosis, uh, for HBV, and also uh, they're now going to develop further diagnostic uh, systems for uh, other communicable diseases, particularly different types of fever. So uh, Molbio and uh, Quantum DX are announcing their collaboration today, so that's a special event for, uh, announcement today as well that will be in the, in the press. So a lot of collaboration both with government and with, uh, between uh, commercial companies. So today we're talking about the future of healthcare and how innovation uh, is the secret to, or less and less the secret, but the answer to uh, the increasing demand and increasing need for healthcare in, uh, in India and also in the UK and how we can collaborate on that. So that's enough from me, so I hope you enjoy the session. We'll be have some time, we hope, for question and answers. Uh, but first of all, we have some speakers. Uh, so we're very, very pleased to welcome uh, Pancha Sani from uh, Medanta Hospitals, CEO of Medanta Hospitals, um, who's going to give us uh, a quick uh, view on his view of how new technology can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of, uh, of Indian uh, healthcare. Pancha, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, good morning. Uh, so the, the couple of questions that uh, Chris asked me to reflect on was one, uh, what is the need for new technology in healthcare to increase efficiency and effectiveness? And uh, are private uh, providers in India interested? And I think uh, the obvious answer to both of these questions is yes. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on whether there's a debate on this. It's, it's pretty obvious that, uh, that this is needed. Um, the point that I would, would try to say is that today there is actually no such thing as uh, a health tech business. All health businesses have technology. Uh, all technology is mobile. So uh, I think the concept of saying that we are into tech or not into tech is actually completely irrelevant in today's world. So all providers, irrespective of your size, if you're in the healthcare space or in any industry for that matter, technology is going to be an active part. I think the real question um, when it comes to using technology to address challenges uh, is uh, is do we really understand the issues? Are we are we very clear about the problem that we're solving? And this is really important uh, to those people who come uh, to healthcare from other industries. Uh, unlike many of the consumer industries where technology has played a, a more active role thus far, uh, what tends to happen is companies design products and hope that customers will buy them. Uh, healthcare does not work like this. Uh, in healthcare, the number one thing to do is to understand what is the real problem. And it's very important to understand that in healthcare, uh, there are some is extremely important gatekeepers that will not allow you to get to the customer. And that is the doctor, that is the healthcare institutions, and that is, the, frankly, the entire health ecosystem. If you really ask me, the technology is there, the patients are there, it's actually the doctors, the health system that is not yet there. And this is something that needs to be addressed when you're a health tech company or a company trying to address some of these problems. So the first thing for me is define the problem very clearly. Now to define the problem, uh, you need to actually uh, live in the ecosystem. Um, what, I, what I tell many folks who come to meet me is uh, five kids in a Bangalore basement are not going to figure out this problem just because they have a doctor on their advisory board. Um, you actually need to live and breathe the system. Spend a couple of hours in a doctor's chamber. Walk behind a doctor when they're on rounds. 
understand what happens in the operating room. Um, I was talking earlier before this session started, lie down on a gurney and see exactly what a patient goes through. If you don't understand what is happening in the health ecosystem, you will build the wrong solution. And a lot of the solutions that we are designing assume that people will behave in a certain way and many times that assumption is flawed. So if you take our hospital for example, our hospital tends to be extremely busy. Most of the doctors who are, uh, who are at the senior most levels, they don't have time to get from their chambers to the toilet. Now asking them to go to this really nice telepresence room that you've created so that we can promote telemedicine is not going to happen. So we, in, in Medanta, we figured out a way, how do we take the technology to the doctor rather than take the doctor to the technology? So you've actually got to break this down and that can't happen unless you live in the ecosystem. And the second part of living in that ecosystem is to say that this is not a solution that only one person is going to come up with. Doctors may not be the best uh, discoverers of this innovation. You need designers, you need psychiatrists, you need human behavioral experts. Uh, most of our experience in, in Medanta, whether it is pertaining to technology or whether it is pertaining to operations, most of the challenges are actually user experience challenges. They are not technology challenges. Technology is actually way ahead of us. Um, but most technology companies, frankly, are not very good at solving the user experience problem. So my advice is define the problem very clearly, bring together the stakeholders, and, and live in the ecosystem. And if you can address these three things, and then think about what is the product or the solution that you are actually trying to offer, you will be much better positioned. And then of course, for, for, for all the friends, uh, I was talking to Chris about this earlier, he was reminding me of what I always say. Um, for all of our friends who have come from overseas, understand that India is a extremely challenging market to do business in. Uh, it is not the UK model minus 30%. It is the new business model. If you come to India thinking that I'll just reduce price a little bit and see if I can get some sales, that will not happen. You need two things to come to India. One is you need a long-term commitment to this country. And the second thing is you need to build a business model that's appropriate for this country, for this customer base. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Pankaj. Thank you. I don't know if we're picking up the applause. This is an interesting experience, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much, Pankaj. So um, please uh, do take a seat and we'll bring you back up on the stage in a minute. So now we have uh, Frank Hester, who's uh, going to come to the stage. Uh, he's CEO of the Phoenix Partnership, or TPP, uh, leading uh, information uh, services pr provider, system provider in the UK. Uh, and he'll tell you all about the millions of records that, uh, that TPP provide in the UK and what, how the innovation that he's developing in his company can be brought to India and help with healthcare challenges here. Frank. Hi. Well, thanks for that introduction. I've spent the last 20 years uh, working in the UK. Um, I'm a software developer uh, by trade. Um, we look after medical records. And it started because my wife was a doctor and I wanted to make a system that really made that doctor-patient experience much better. Because I could see she was wa wasting a lot of time doing administrative tasks. And now we're all here 20 years later. That system flourished. I, I love your point about sitting on the gurney, you know. And I think I was lucky because I had empathy with my wife and I could see what needed to be fixed. Now we've got just short of 50 million patients on our system. We work in the NHS, and, and we have the benefit of something called primary care. And the whole purpose of this is to keep patients out of hospital. And now I come to India, and I think, what's the problem here? I spent the last five years kind of going around the world looking at Brazil, spent a lot of time in China, Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, Qatar. We've looked at the Australian model, we've looked at the New Zealand model, looked at the Canadian model. And none of these models are gonna work in your country. You know, I would, I would love to be sat here saying, oh, just copy the American model and you'll be fine. Um, because those models actually aren't working in the countries that they're in. And I, 
I think from the previous speaker, you're right, it needs a new model. 1.2 billion people. It's a daunting number. I come from a country with, you know, about 60 million people. 1.2 billion. I can't get my head around that number. And you're growing apparently at 17%. Well, well done. <laughs> you know, 17% per year. <coughs> I want to talk about a practical solution because I am an engineer by trade. 60% of deaths in India are due to non-communicable diseases. Uh, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease. And the financial burden of that is impossible and it's growing. This is not unique to India, it, it's happening every, in every country. When I go to China, they tell me their big thing is NCDs. When I go to Saudi Arabia, it's all about diabetes. You know. So I want to talk about a practical solution. And looking at a country today, you've got a tiny bit of primary care. You've got ashes out in the community. And I think what, what I've got in the UK is fantastic primary care. I've got a whole range of doctors and nurses that are highly trained. But it's absolutely impossible to transfer that bulk into India. We, we can barely afford it in the UK. You can't afford it here. And I think it's very important that any solution has got to deal with the inequalities. It's got to work for the people in the villages. It's got to work for grandma. It's got to work for the children in the villages. Um, and it's got to work for the ashes. So I'm going to be very straightforward and simple. AI has now come of age. It's, it's, not, it's not just a thing on the TV. It's not about driverless cars. AI actually works in healthcare right now. We can predict uh, cancer. We can, we can stratify diabetes. We can stratify elderly care to a, to a scale that we just couldn't do before. And it's happened in the last two or three years. Some of you will know this and you'll be like, I get it. Some of you won't know it. Um, but this is the future. And we can now design systems where we can let the AI manage the diabetes. Or we let the AI stratify the elderly to work out who's frail. Or let the AI predict who's going to get cancer. And I say this because I've experienced this myself. We're actually working on it now. So quite simply, AI combined with cell phones or smartphones allows patients to directly input their own symptoms and their own conditions. The AI can then communicate with the patient or the citizen and can manage their care to an extent that wasn't possible before. What does that mean for the patient? Because, you know, AI's fantastic maths, a lot of matrix manipulation. Well, what does it mean for the patient? It means simply saying, are you still in pain? Is, is your mother still feeling dizzy? How is your husband today? Do you still have abdominal pain? And the AI can manage a range of NCDs at a scale that wasn't possible before. Quite simply, through mobile technology, which is accessible across most of India. What does it mean for the doctor or for the ASHA? Well, it means this AI becomes part of the team. AI is there to give the ASHA a nudge or the doctor a nudge, saying, hang on, this looks like ovarian cancer right now. Something that a doctor could easily miss, no matter how educated they are, but just that nudge. And the ashers who haven't been trained in medical school, we can actually bring them up and give a, give a level of care that's unprecedented. 
and replicate, to some extent, the wonderful primary care that I've been blessed with in England. And so much, we can't replicate all of it, <coughs> but we can actually bring up a level that was not possible before. And what does it mean for government? It allows government to monitor and say, look, this doctor needs help. This, this Asher's doing fine. This Asher needs some more training. Or here we've got a problem with diabetes. Let's focus on that. And in a way, I, previously we've run healthcare at a very small level, at a hospital level or a GP practice level. But I, I invite you to think about state level, insurance level, countrywide level. A scale you might never have thought of before because it's possible now. It wasn't possible before. And with this, we can get value-based healthcare, improvements on a scale that we've never thought about before you know i think we can actually do it better than we do it in the uk i can see chris looking at his yeah. watch <laughs> you're nearly at the end frank i'm definitely nearly at the end uh, thank you um but delivered quite cheaply using the existing doctors that you've got using the existing ashes that you have i propose to you you know, I invite the Indian companies and, and uh, the UK companies, spin up the AIs, you know, start talking with the, with the cell phones and the smartphones, and you will transform healthcare. And I'll just say one more thing. I haven't even touched on genomics there. You can just do that by asking patients simple questions. When we get to genomics, we get sexy. <laughs> and we really, really get transformational. But just that, just with the cell phones, just with the smartphones, spin up the AIs. And I look forward to seeing your solutions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Uh, please, please take your seat. And uh, uh, next up is uh, Ron Mobed, who's the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Elsevier, which is a division of Relics. And he's going to talk also about the applications of digital health innovations in, uh, in India and, uh, and in other countries. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. So I'd like to, I'd like to build on the previous two speakers um, because their remarks, I thought, were very relevant to what I'm going to say. I, to paraphrase a little bit um, those two speakers, the first was understand health deeply locally before you start building a product. And I think the second speaker, Frank, was talking about the power of technology, which could be deployed at a very macro scale to change dramatically the outcomes that people are seeking in healthcare systems around the world. The reason I, I want to build on those two is because we at Elsevier think exactly in those terms. Um, so. Elsevier's history goes back a very long way. Um, the Lancet, which is one of Elsevier's publications, was started in 1823. Um, the name of Elsevier goes back to 1580. And our presence in India goes back um, to 1996. So we, we've got a history in the world of health, not only around the world, but uh, even also in India. What I want to talk about a little bit is how we can deliver on the promise and the challenge that almost every healthcare system has around the world, which is to deliver improved healthcare to the population at reduced cost. And I think the two speakers, in combination, gave a clue to the solution, which is, first of all, a deep understanding of healthcare, of medicine, of clinical practice in the local environment. Healthcare is local, after all. And secondly, with that understanding, to combine with technologies that can deliver at scale replicable solutions that can be relied upon. 
I want to give you a couple of examples of how Elsevier has been working in this direction over the last few years. So one example comes from the UK, but could be deployed in, uh, in India, potentially. So this is a, a, a system which does some of the things that Frank was talking about. I'm sure Frank's system sounds a lot more sophisticated, but at root, it's taking uh, an AI-based system built on top of clinical guidelines, in this particular case, the UK's clinical guidelines, and has reduced the symptom checking to a series of questions and answers that the general public can understand that can be used as a mirror, a two-way mirror, either by the, the potential patient, the member of the public, or by the triage nurse or doctor at the other end of the phone line. And the idea is uh, essentially a system that allows a patient to say on a mobile device, I've got a sore throat. The first question is, do you have a temperature? The next question is driven by the answer to that first question, do you have trouble breathing? The next question is driven by the answer to that question, are you pregnant? The next question is driven by the answer to that question. And the result is either an instruction to go to the local pharmacy, to go to your primary care physician, your general practitioner when you have time, or to go to the emergency room. I'm simplifying a little bit to give you a sense of what the, the purpose of this system might be. This has been deployed already at scale in the UK. It's been deployed in NHS England uh, for a few years until uh, 2016. And the data suggests that about 1.3 million visits to the doctors by patients uh, that could have been avoided were avoided through the system. It's currently in use in NHS Scotland, uh, not on the patient side, but on the triage side by the person on the other end of the phone listening to the patient, asking exactly those same questions and entering them into the system and coming up with the same three-pronged answer. Go to the pharmacy, go to the primary care physician, go to the emergency room. Now, healthcare is local. Those systems are built on top of UK clinical guidelines. But they can be deployed in other countries using the local guidelines that are relevant to that country. The opportunity then is to take the global technological capability, not to redesign it for a local environment, but to combine it with locally relevant content in order to deliver a solution. Now, I'm giving you one example of how a combination of reliable content, technology, can be deployed in front of this problem I've started to talk about, which is how do you deliver better quality healthcare for lower cost? There are many other con conditions and use cases that need treatment. The, uh, the primary uh, triage is not the only work of a healthcare system. And, um, and we heard Frank talk about some of the, uh, the in-hospital conditions that might be treated. There are other use cases for which other solutions, which are much more based on deep reference works or the latest research in combination with the expertise of the individual consultants or teams that are working on very complex uh, conditions that can also be deployed using these types of technologies to help standardize oncology care across the entire life of the, the patient's treatment plan. But I wanted to focus on one example of how digital healthcare can make transformational differences by using the combination that I mentioned before. Deep local knowledge, deep understanding of medicine, combined with technologies that can power solutions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ron. So before we uh, bring our speakers back uh, for some questions and answers, we'd like to uh, bring to the stage uh, Sir Malcolm Grant and Anna Roy. So um, here's your name cards. Um, so Sir Malcolm is our business ambassador for healthcare uh, in the Department for International Trade, but also very re until re very recently the chairman of NHS England, uh, for all the NHS in the whole country of England. Um, and. Uh, Anna Roy is the senior advisor with Niti Ayog, who's been working with us on our healthcare artificial intelligence catalyst, uh, which has just been uh, uh, announced and launched uh, in, in another room, another place uh, in, the, in the area. So welcome to the stage. And uh, just a little bit of conversation, really. <laughs> so Anna, why do you think we need innovation? Why is it so crucial to reach the the whole population in India to meet the healthcare needs of the whole population. Why wouldn't you want to uh, meet the uh, 
No, I didn't get the question. Uh, you are asking me, uh, do we need innovation to meet the health in, in order to reach the whole population, because we okay. know that the population the is more remote okay. in many cases okay. yeah, and not yeah. getting the health care that they, they need. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't uh, get your Sorry, question. I wasn't very clear. Uh, so, uh, basically, I think, uh, I don't know how many of uh, the uh, audience has gone through our strategy. This is exactly what we have covered in the strategy. Uh, we are saying that, uh, you know, AI is the buzzword, like uh, blockchain is also a buzzword these days. But we are trying to uh, humanize AI and say how AI can be actually a technology uh, having maximum impact. And uh, we have also identified the sectors uh, which the government should really play a role in and keep away from the others where we feel the top line can drive innovation and adoption. Now, uh, the five sectors which we have uh, selected out of which the more important ones are the healthcare, health, education and agriculture. And uh, why these are important and why innovation is required? Uh, precisely because of the size and scale of the sector, the challenges, uh, the, uh, you know, where you need to reach and the various problems of access barriers, etc. So that makes, you know, the AI as uh, the latest technology uh, uh, helps us in addressing the barrier, which I think uh, previous, uh, if, you, if you look at the previous uh, stages of industrial revolution, those were not really so much uh, uh, addressing that. Now with this new technology revolution distributed, uh, and everything is becoming distributed, whether it is, you know, uh, energy generation, whether it is provision of services. Uh, so the technology is enabling you that. And I think uh, here is the opportunity for India to really do a um, uh, major jump in addressing many of these things which we have been facing for several decades and not being able to kind of overcome because of resource crunch and uh, still access, uh, you know, remains a problem. People don't want to go to remote areas, the professionals. So this innovation, I think, gives us that opportunity. And thank you very much, Anna. And, and do you think uh, that today you've been launching the, the healthcare artificial intelligence catalyst with the UK? Um, do, do you think, can you see some benefit in bringing some UK expertise and maybe from other countries too, but bringing UK expertise as part of that innovation drive? Yeah, so one of the things uh, which we have talked about is collaboration mm. and uh, we feel that like in several other sectors, we can be, uh, again, uh, you know, we can uh, benefit from as a late mover, get the late mover's advantage. Uh, but then I, I think what Mr. Sahani spoke was, uh, he brilliantly put it in context. Uh, even I share that view, I feel development of technology is not the hard part. It is the implementation and adoption on the mm, ground mm, and especially mm. in sectors like uh, health, education and uh, agriculture uh, where you know you could be throwing a baby with the mm. bath water if you are not careful mm. and uh, while a doctor may be making a wrong prediction just every now and then but uh, there you have no uh, control. Here uh, I would just like to give an anecdotal uh, uh, example, I would not like to name the company. We are promoting a number of startups, mm -hmm. Indian startups as well, uh, and uh, the technology which they are trying mm -hmm. to uh, use. Now, uh, in one of the expert level meeting, that uh, technology was totally discredited by a group of doctors. And there, there they were saying that by the pulses were so high that you could uh, uh, lead to anxiety and ma various other things in the, in the prediction. So validation of the model, adoption, uh, you know, uh, the ground level challenges, the infrastructure required and what really is re uh, required, I think that is the major challenge and that is where uh, Niti is trying to work with various stakeholders uh, to go forward. And uh, we have welcomed, uh, you know, uh, uh, by the way, Ron, I don't know whether you know or not, uh, you are one of the five, but I have been in touch with your team, they are sitting behind for some time now. And we have been working with them to uh, see how we can kind of uh, bring in this technology, but then validation for the Indian data set, validation for the local condition is very important. Thank you very much, Anna. I think we're all talking about the, the practical uh, operation and, and implementation of uh, innovation as being the, 
the key as much as the technology itself. But so Malcolm, I mean, this is a challenge for all healthcare systems. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how we in the NHS attempt to bring innovation into the NHS and then to spread it across the NHS? Well, I'd very much like to do that. I'd like to do it particularly in the context of AI, um, because it seems to me, and certainly from our experience in the UK, that AI has the capacity against huge data sets such as Frank has outlined to us, uh, to bring down costs, to increase accuracy and to uh, improve the the level of diagnostics that we can give to our patients. So all of that, let's take that as a given. Uh, I think the thing that intrigues me and I've really taken with the speeches I've just heard uh, is that to embed such innovation within a healthcare system is completely different from doing it in IT and mobile telephony and other areas uh, in which Silicon Valley has shown the way to the rest of the world. It's completely different for the reasons Mr. Salmi has identified. Uh, it's completely different because you can introduce a new phone with bugs. You can't introduce a new innovation into healthcare with bugs. Human life is at stake. And the thing I would emphasize in all of this is twofold. First of all, where I've seen it work best in the NHS is where clinicians have gone out to AI developers and said, can you help us solve this problem? A wonderful example, you'll read about it in uh, the Nature uh, Medicine edition of mid-August this year which is around the use of optical coherence tomography by Moorfields Eye Hospital using DeepMind as their AI developers to be able to identify with 96% accuracy 50 common eye diseases in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost uh, that otherwise was being used by clinicians. So that for me is a very good example and it, it also illustrates something else, that we must bring AI into healthcare with appropriate scientific rigor. By scientific rigor, I mean open data, I mean uh, replicability, I mean publication, communication, and an ability with open data for others to come in and further develop these concepts. So I think there are fundamental rules uh, at work here. And then the next part of this, and it touches upon something that Frank said at the end of his presentation, which this is not just about predictive, personalized medicine, although we know we can make huge inroads on that. The future that we were never able to dream of will come from new biotechnologies, which will generate vast amounts of data, and genomics is probably the key one at the moment. 3.2 billion base pairs in every human being, 22,000 genes, and at last, an ability to start to comprehend how those genes interact. And um, we've, in the NHS now, not only sequenced 100,000 whole genomes, remember the cost originally was a billion dollars to sequence a whole genome, it's now falling rapidly under $1,000 and will come down to $100 quite soon. I mean, this, this is the pace of change, and it completely transforms our understanding of the human body and of biological science. Uh, so we are now, from this year, rolling out whole genome sequencing into routine clinical care in the NHS and using this as a vector for transformation, for innovation, for standardization over phenotyping, uh, and to start to transform from within and that's the first point, from within, not from outside. There will be many innovations that come from outside. Google, Apple, and others are investing heavily in health and in data and the analytics for the future. But if only we can capture the enthusiasm of our clinicians and patients who come to expect these levels of diagnostics, then I think we're on to a winner. But my cautionary story is, beware the cowboys. Uh, this has to be absolutely scientifically, rigorously done and properly regulated with appropriate degrees of privacy, but with open uh, publication and open access to data uh, uh, as a consequence. Thank, thank you very much, Sir Malcolm. I, I mean, the NHS obviously uh, you know, is, is trying to introduce uh, a lot of these innovations, um, and we've tried to bring together academia, industry, and, uh, and the NHS, the healthcare system. Um, do you think there's anything we've, we've, we've done in the UK that uh, it might be useful learning for, for India as well? Uh, academic health science networks, for example, or uh, some of the clinical entrepreneur schemes we've had. Is there other things that you think we can bring to India as ideas uh, to help bring those different parties together that you talked about? Yes, I mean, it's, it's an immensely complex ecosystem. We've obviously got the huge advantage in the UK of outstanding universities and really strong life sciences. And as you may know, I was formerly the vice chancellor of UCL, uh, where we developed some fascinating interactions between the university and the clinic. Uh, and without those 
laboratory research goes on in one sector and never properly joins up. And that's, I think, where people have found a lot of frustration in the past. We do outstanding science, but we can't get it into the clinic. And one of the reasons for that is the absence of clinicians. So we've invested a lot in developing a new generation of clinician scientists, an MB-PhD program to allow us to, to bridge that gap. Secondly, in bringing computing scientists in to work along with engineers. Uh, sorry, there's a wasp. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and other disciplines to make this work. But then nationally, we, we establish a system of academic health science networks which joins up the clinic and the university and industry uh, around the table, working closely together, trying to work out. So the clinicians have to drive this. What are the problems that need to be solved and how do we bring in these other forces to help us do that? And then we bring in the universities. What's happening in the laboratories? How do we merge that together? And then in, where's industry interested in coming into this? Uh, I think that where the NHS has been impervious to innovation has been where there is a customary cultural way of doing things. And Mr. Salmi's points, I think, were very well taken on this. Uh, and um, where it's expensive to bring the innovation in and nobody has the money or the time. So we have introduced a new tariff for innovation. Hospitals get rewarded for bringing innovation into the, into the ward. And we've got to overcome some of the cultural stasis uh, to excite people, innovation has to be better than what we're doing at the moment. Better for, not just for doctors, but better for patients. And also, it has to make financial sense for the hospital that's introducing it. Thank you. Anna, we've talked about this, uh, the importance of uh, innovation being adopted practically and with strong clinician uh, engagement. Um, I mean, for you, and I think Sir Malcolm said, you've got to start with the problem. I mean, what specific problems do you think are the ones uh, in India we're trying to address most urgently, most critically? Uh, so uh, we have been working with the Tata um, uh, Center, Cancer uh, Research Center in Mumbai. Uh, they have a heat map, uh, and that shows the distance traveled by people coming to uh, Mumbai for cancer treatment. And uh, that has formed the basis based on which we are uh, piloting a project to say that how through a hub and spoke kind of a model, we can uh, not only reduce the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, problem that the patients face, but also uh, lower the burden on the main hospitals. Like Mr. Sani mentioned, about uh, his hospital, uh, you know, doctors not having time, uh, you know, they are so stressed. Please go to Ames. Like, I'm amazed. It only takes somebody with a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know, they, they appear to be different people. The way they treat uh, patients, you know, there are hordes and hordes of people out there in their rooms. So I think that's the story uh, just about everywhere in India. So uh, that, I think, is the first area if we could have a, a hub and spoke kind of a thing where uh, we have better predictive tools in, say, PHCs. That is the model that we are working on. And then at district level and then at, uh, you know, more uh, metro kind of big hospitals. Uh, like one of the projects that we are working on, this is uh, on uh, diabetic retinopathy, where uh, a group of uh, doctors in a big hospital like Ames would go through the reports uh, generated through this model at a PHC and then they will give a, uh, you know, a, a, a analysis or, or, or a prescription based on the AI tool. So that I feel will be the biggest thing which we can uh, kind of do uh, as the first stage. Then of course going forward prediction etc. the innovation will take, forward, uh, will take place but to me that appears to be the first major thing we should uh, get cracking. Thank you. And how much time have we got? Um, you know, when, how quickly do you think it's possible to uh, achieve some of these changes and to filter the patients in the way you're describing uh, with predictive uh, analysis uh, tools? Uh, I mean, we know that governments are always um, very ambitious and, uh, in, and, and impatient, but how, how do you see this as a program? Is it, is it a one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year? Uh, I wouldn't like to give a, a time frame really, but I can tell you where we are today. Uh, 
government has already uh, kind of rolled out a, a program for upgrading PXCs. Uh, I think a one uh, one thousand twenty five hundred. I don't 150,000, yeah. 150,000, okay, you are better <laughs> informed. So 150,000 um, PXCs have been identified for upgrading. So what we are doing in NITI is to work with the health ministry and the concerned states to identify some of these better placed PXCs who have the capability and where through a minimum training of the ground staff, we are able to deploy some of these tools. Mm -hmm where uh, you know uh, where the predictive part is taken care of there is no invasive uh, treatment being given and uh, the tools which are deployed are kind of validated for local conditions that is the first stage which we are working on uh, we already have zeroed in a few and uh, that 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 is for the uh, already developed tools the second stage is uh, the Tata Center we are, with whom we are working on. They have some 12 years of record. So that would involve uh, their um, digitized clinical records, pathology and radiology. So that is a, a year uh, and a half kind of a time frame. And that would be really a model trained on Indian data and uh, very robust in that sense. Thank you, Anna. This is uh, good. Um, this is a, a quite a good experiment, I think, having our seminars outside. <laughs> um, so, so Malcolm, really, I mean, you are a great friend of India and come here regularly. Um, I mean, what is your hope that uh, we'll be able to see as a collaboration between the UK and India within the next uh, two to three years? Well, I'm very impressed by the, um, the Catalyst program that we've launched today, um, and I hope that bears fruit. But five companies, it's going to have to grow rapidly. Uh, so five companies can be a pilot for what we can do between the two countries. I mean, I, I'm always impressed when I come to India by the, the sense of energy and possibility, by the technological skills and mathematical skills of a well-educated population. When I was in Bangalore yesterday, they told me they had two million data scientists in Bangalore alone. Uh, so um, I think that's rather more than we've got in the entire UK. Uh, so there's enormous possibility for, for collaboration here. And these things can be done remotely. Not all of this requires intimate um, collaboration around a laboratory bench or even in a clinic. Um, I think the, 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 big, the big issue that combines everything that we're talking about today is data. Data is going to continue to grow exponentially and in healthcare above any other sector. Genomics will be a huge contribution, so will proteomics, bioomics, metabolomics, etc., etc. We can see all of that coming through. It's how we interrogate the data. We're still in the foothills, actually. For all our talk today about artificial intelligence and neural circuits and deep learning, which is fantastic technology, I cannot believe that it will not have transformed again in five years' time. People will be saying, well, what were they talking about uh, five years ago? It, it, it's going to be very, very different. So I'm a huge optimist. Uh, and what this does is place India and the UK on an equal footing in terms of technological development. Uh, and I think there is huge opportunities for mutual collaboration. Thank you very much, Sir Malcolm. Can we just say thank you to Anna Roy and Sir Malcolm Grant for those uh, contributions? Thank you very much. Now, if the other speakers would like to join, rejoin the, the panel, I'll stand up. Um, so, uh, and it's time for questions uh, from you. Uh, so, have you got the roving microphones? Um, have you got microphones for the audience? No, 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 please do stay here on the panel, yes. So uh, there's an opportunity to, um, to ask questions of any of, the, uh, any of the speakers or panel members, um, and uh, we're just hopefully going to get a uh, roving microphone. So yes, here's our first question, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for, it was a very intriguing session, and uh, let me just give you a physician's perspective as a doctor uh, who currently works on the genomic side. Um, I think. I'll make a point and then I'll make the question. The question will be to, to Ron and to Frank. Uh, it, and it's, it's very relevant to what Pankaj said, which is really related to um, how do we get AI and data to influence behavior change? And that's the critical aspect when you look at local population, local behavior. For all the AI intrigue as a clinician, as a doctor, if we think we're going to get a mobile phone to influence a patient in an urban setting, let alone a rural setting, to decide whether he goes to a GP practice or a primary healthcare center, 
I think that that's pretty far away. So my question really to Frank would be, how do we use all the knowledge that you've gathered over all these aspects of time? How do we help to the very valid point that you made? Maybe it's the push to the ASHA worker or to the local structure to then go to the patient, to move the patient to that care of need. How do we do that from a data standpoint? It's not going to happen if you're just going to let the patient decide just interacting with a mobile device. I think that's, that's pretty far away. And thank you, and I completely disagree. <laughs> um, but y your question's right. How do we do it? I particularly liked Sir Malcolm's uh, point about it has to come from within. And this isn't Apple, this isn't Google. This is us, this is our lives. So our first AI project was ovarian cancer. Now, this is something that my auntie died from, and, and some of you will have lost a loved one due to this dreadful disease. And the challenge was put to us by our clinician, Dr. John Parry. He said, solve this one, fix this one. I, it's not a cell, it's your mother, it's your grandmother, it's your daughter. Put something on the phone that's gonna help spot that, that thing. It's, it's something that benefits, it's something that people want to do. It's something that you will want your daughter to have. It's something that your mother will want to use. I think it's too easy to think of AI as driverless cars or I'm talking about early detection of prostate cancer, early detection of ovarian cancer. And when you put it in those terms, and I remember the day when we cracked it, when, when we actually did it, there was silence across our office. It wasn't clapping and cheering. It was just bloody silence because we realized the awesome nature of what we got. This is truly an industrial revolution. I, I, I compare this to the antibiotic and the vaccine for NCDs. And it's just about the data. That's all it is. Okay, thank you. Pankaj, do you want to uh, respond to that as well? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it's actually just about data. I do agree that uh, it makes a compelling case. Uh, and, and I think the issue that we struggle with is that, look, we'll get there. Um, the problem is we don't have the time. Um, people are dying of this every day. And, and I think really the challenge that we see on the ground is one of incentives. Um, and, and incentives across every system. If you think of it like this, when you approach a doctor to say, I've got this great product on AI, his first question is, will I be out of a job? His first question is not, this is phenomenal, it can help my patients. Now, that might be unfortunate, but that is the reality. And so I think when you think about how data is going to play a role, how artificial intelligence is going to play a role, or how innovation in general is going to play a role, I think you have to think about incentives across the system. And this is another aspect that I think, frankly, startups don't think about, uh, tech companies don't think about, because Frankly, we're just all so amazed by the awesomeness of the product that we're developing. We don't actually want to think about the incentives of the other people in the chain. So I think that to make this work, you need data. It needs to make a compelling case. Um, but you need to think about the incentives. And particularly, you need to think about whose life are you influencing or affecting for the worse? Because that's the person that's going to try to kill your project. Yeah, thank you. I think Can I just make a remark on please, this? Because Ron, I think it's a yeah. very important It point. is about the patient, I think the question was. It is about the patient. And I, I think some of the comments have been sort of uh, poking at what I think is a general question about change management and the introduction of a successful system, which isn't only dependent on technology. It's not actually only dependent on the doctor. If I genericize it, it's a combination of, of people, the doctors and the patients, technology, and process. These, these are system-wide activities, and any one of those components, if missing, will cause the system to fail. Now, healthcare is different to other sectors, but we can learn within healthcare how change management of this type of nature has been handled in other sectors and adapt the learnings, which are more behavioral project type of learnings as opposed to technology learnings, and apply them inside our system to make sure that when we deploy, we deploy successfully. Thank you. Looks like there's a question over there. Thank you. Yeah, my question is to uh, Ron from uh, Relics Group. 
So you mentioned that you are here in India from 1996, and uh, also you spoke about the triaging solution that you have implemented. So has this been piloted in India, and what has been your experience of uh, having, you know, taken a sort of NHS kind of a content into Indian market? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Let me very quickly answer. So remember what I what I was pointing at, which is that this system allows the localization while the technology is global. So it could be that the guidelines that are being used in the UK could be applicable in India, but that's not what we're seeing when we try to deploy. Uh, and I think um, my colleagues here at Elsevier India were telling me just before the session that we are part of this uh, uh, catapult innovation program, which potentially could lead to the early deployment of this system in India. Can you, you. Can you, will you hand the microphone to this gentleman here? In the meantime, um, let me take a couple of questions and allow the panel to respond. So you next, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Madan. I'm a radiologist by training, but I am looking at the problem from a primary care perspective. Uh, respected madam just announced that uh, part of the Prime Minister's initiative, we are starting uh, 1.5 lakh health and wellness clinics. And compared to that, when you juxtapose the primary care delivery models with what is existing in the UK and to what is right now available in India, that's where we start. So what are the deliverables that we are looking at to deliver in that primary care level? So what are the systems that we are looking at deploying at that level? So whatever we spoke about right now are all problems, deliverables that are in the tertiary care level. So we diagnose diabetic retinopathy in primary care, primary care level in a BHC, but who is going to treat them? The treatment, where does the treatment happen? If it has to be validated by a doctor sitting in Ames, even the data that is delivered or taken from a primary care health care center, that who is going to treat those patients? Okay. Good point. Very good point. I'm just going to take a second question, then last the panel. This is our last question. I'm really sorry, uh, but I've been told we must uh, wrap up very soon. Yeah. So, Dr. Sarjit Dudeja, I will talk about personal medicine or precision medicine, which is the future medicine. Uh, do you think that we will have a genome of every human, like X-ray or ultrasound, so that we can diagnose and we can take care of medicine by editing genes, like I did by PAG on muscular dystrophy. It's a very rare disease. And that can be done only by genetic engineering or gene therapy or gene editing. So we say now future will be a precision medicine or personal medicine. So every human will have its own medicine for a treatment. So how long it will take to be in India? Okay, that's two very different questions, but very good questions. So uh, um, I'm going to take it along the panel there. So Malcolm, do you want to make a quick comment? And we're just going to take a comment from each member of the panel. Okay, just very quickly, the question about how we treat patients is fundamental to all of this. And one of the big concerns is that the more we understand from the data, unexpected relationships that we never had understood previously, so more patients come forward for treatment. I think the only counterbalance to that is if we can get in earlier, so the treatment need not be so expensive and so dramatic. Take ovarian cancer, for example. We know that if we can catch that at stage one or stage two, it's much better than at stage three or four. Uh, I think the second question requires a much longer answer, which I don't think we can probably go into, but CRISPR technologies uh, which allow gene editing are going to be fundamental. Uh, they will combine on the back of genomics. Uh, we'll be better understand how to um, uh, treat diseases which previously have been beyond our reach. And yet at the same time, we need a most powerful ethical framework for this work, as we've just seen as a consequence of those interventions in China. Uh, we've got to be very careful how we roll out the technologies at a rate which will command public support. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, the implementation part is the challenge. I'm, I don't have the solutions. That's why I did not answer uh, Chris's question about <laughs> what time frame. These are very complex things. The, uh, the tools are developing. And you know, we still are in that phase of a black box AI where we don't know based on what the um, uh, solution is coming. So we have to go slowly. PHC program is a standalone program. What Niti is doing is in a couple of states to do a pilot to see how a hub and spoke can work. So when I uh, refer to the AIMS thing, that was a specific different uh, project which AIMS is doing. 
they are developing a another kind of a product that is separate but when we go to a, when we install it in a state in a phc we would ask the state to connect that phc to say a district hospital or to another metro hospital those connect connections would need to be made so a there is a early detection b some of it you know it could be that i i am not a doctor i am a economist by training i am a technocrat so i will not have all the answers today but the idea basic rationale is early detection so that the treatment is not that complex b when you connect it so you know not everybody goes uh, goes to the district hospital the uh, pressure on district hospitals uh, comes down so that is what we are aiming at and we are starting very small we are not announcing that we will install this tool the tool will have to be validated that is the crucial part so we are long way Thank away you. from that Thank you. quick comments from the three speakers um, <clears throat> so i'll take the second question first uh, personalized medicine has been in india for centuries it's called ayurveda uh, the problem is that we haven't figured out a way to actually codify this and actually prove this to the satisfaction of modern medicine and unfortunately we as humans are all weak we're looking for the pill solution ayurveda is the lifestyle solution um so there is a bunch of challenges with personalized medicine that being said i think whether it's crispr or whatever other technologies uh we will get there it will take us generations i don't think that we will in at least my lifetime see everybody's genome at birth and then you kind of live your life as per that but we will get there in bits and pieces uh on the question of uh, primary care i think uh I'm going to steal a little bit from uh, Bill Clinton's speech at the Labour Party conference in, in I think 2006, where he said, "We live in an interdependent world. The problem is we need to be living in an integrated world. And when you actually think about uh, delivery of care at the primary level, we have now in India rolled out thousands of these common service centres where young entrepreneurs uh, at the village level are able to use." technology to provide banking solutions health solutions etc the question is when a doctor says you have this disease you need medicine now how do i get the supply chain of the medicines there how do i maintain the cold chain if to conclude on this you need a ct scan how do i get a ct scan in the village the problem is that each of us think of the solutions in our silos uh we very rarely think of solutions across the system and it's the same in the government uh conversations that we've had with various ministries where we're talking about this is the ministry of communications and technology that is interested in getting the it solution out there but it's not their problem on how you cure the patient that's a ministry of health's problem so i don't know i mean frankly the niti ayog is trying to do a good job of putting all of this and stitching all of this together but this is an immensely complicated problem the only thing that i would say uh from from the private side is that look pick an area start small because uh uh if we don't start something we will just keep talking in forums like this and nothing will get achieved thank you ron the buzz those were both i think uh, very broad and general questions and in the interest of time i'll try and keep my answers also very broad but quite short the first question i think my impression of having <coughs> seen systems in in operations in other sectors apart from medicine is that um processes tend to be influenced by the the technology that's put in place and vice versa So as these systems tend to be deployed activities tend to flow to where the greatest benefit is seen. Uh, somebody said it's all about the individual it's about the doctor and the patient. As these systems get introduced doctors and patients will realize how best to use the things and it might give rise to additional demand or reduced demand as I, I think uh, we heard earlier on. But you'll get that flow coming around and you I think you want to encourage that flow to allow the specialists to use the the, the capability how they see fit. Um the second question about the future the general answer I'd give there is as technology allows the um the absorption of more and more data and to make richer and richer combinations of those data then the quality of the answer the solution the diagnosis and treatment plan individually will rise. I don't think there's a, there's one single event that's going to give rise to an immediate change. this will be a gradual incremental it could be very fast improvement in capability as the as the technology the data volumes increase thank you very last brief word from frank brief <laughs> so although i violently agree with all the panel 
I think for fun, I'm going to disagree. I've spent the last 20 years doing nothing but introducing change into the NHS. That's my whole life is what I do. It's not that complicated. Just build it better and people will take it. When I started with computers 40 years ago, it was a male-only world. There were no girls in it. But somehow, my wife picks up a smartphone and starts texting. How, 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 how does a girl do that? I was brought up that girls didn't do computers. It, it, just make it easy to use, build a better mousetrap, and it's done. This is an industrial revolution that we haven't seen before. And I think, to the gentleman who said when, I say now, and we're not replacing doctors. Doctors are busy. We're just making life better for you. That's a great note to end on. Thanks very much, Frank. Well, thank you all for uh, coming to, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up now. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this uh, Future Tech Festival session. You may want to talk directly to the colleague there. Um, uh, thank you very much for coming to the Future Tech Festival. This is uh, great for collaboration. Uh, this is, we're going to be introducing our 11 companies to some of the top CEOs of, uh, of healthcare in Delhi uh, this, this afternoon. So we're looking forward to that. So thank you very much. I'd like very much to thank the panel in particular, Sir Malcolm, Anna, uh, Pankaj, Ron and Frank, uh, can we just say uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.